It's too much work. So many preparations have to be made. Well, the preparations are finally made. The wedding day finally arrives. Jack and Jill are surrounded by friends and family. All the people who mean the most to them in the whole world have gathered together to celebrate the union of this very special couple. The wedding ceremony is beautiful, goes off without a hitch. Finally, the pastor says, I now pronounce you man and wife. Jack and Jill kiss. Everyone recedes out of the sanctuary to go to the reception, which is also a wonderful party. Jill smears cake in Jack's face, and everyone has a great time. And when the reception is finally over, everyone expects them to launch off on their honeymoon. Jill turns to Jack at that moment and exclaims, wasn't this a wonderful day? And Jack replies, yes, it was terrific. I love you, Jill. Jack replies, I love you too. I'll see you in 49 years. I'm sorry, Jill replies, I love you too, Jack. I'll see you in 49 years. It's a date, Jack says. And they shake hands, and they go their separate ways, and they don't see each other for 49 years. Why 49? Well, because they're planning a huge blowout celebration for their 50th wedding anniversary. And you see, this party is going to be so grand, it's going to make their wedding pale in comparison. And Since this celebration is going to be on such a major scale, they expect it to take at least a year to plan, and so they're going to get together in 49 years. What's wrong with this picture? Does that strike anybody here as strange? Well, of course it's strange. Why? Because what I've just described are two events separated by a long period of time with nothing to tie them together. There's a wedding on one end, an anniversary celebration on the other, but there's no relationship in between. There's nothing to connect the two events and give them meaning. They're just two unrelated and ultimately meaningless parties. So one would have to ask the question, what's the point? I mean, what is the point? Why would Jack and Jill go to all that trouble to get married in the first place if the only purpose is to schedule another party? Well, you know, I think that we often do that with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we do evangelism, we share Jesus with others, we we might say something like this, would you rather go to heaven or hell when you die? Well, for most people, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Who wants to go to hell? So they might say, I'd rather go to heaven, thank you. Wonderful, we say. Let me tell you how to do that. All you have to do is believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead and ask him to forgive you of your sins, and then when you die, you go to heaven instead of hell. What's wrong with that picture? Does that message strike anyone as strange? It should. It really should. Why? Because what I just described are two events separated by a long period of time with nothing to tie them together. There's a prayer on one end and a big party on the other, but there's no relationship in between. There's nothing to connect the two events and give them meaning. They're just two unrelated and ultimately meaningless events. So we could ask the same question as before. What's the point? And what is the point? Why bother getting saved in the first place if the only purpose is to have a big party at the end? Now, I think you would all agree with me when I say that the purpose of marriage is neither a wedding nor an anniversary celebration. The essence of marriage is a relationship, right? A lifelong relationship. Now, clearly, there has to be an official starting point to that relationship. We call this a wedding. And there very well may be a big celebration near the end, and we call this an anniversary. But the point is neither the wedding nor the anniversary, is it? The point is the relationship in between. Because see, the purpose of marriage is not an event, but a process. It's the relationship which infuses these events with meaning and significance. The same is true of the Christian life. It is primarily a lifelong, long-term relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, granted, there has to be an official starting point for this relationship, and we might call that conversion, and there will definitely be a big party on the other end. We call that heaven. 
But Christianity is not primarily about conversion. It's not even about heaven. It's about the relationship in between. You see, the purpose of our salvation is not an event, but a process. It's the relationship with God which infuses these events with meaning and significance. This is what Jesus was trying to tell us, I believe, in John 17, 3. In this verse, Jesus actually defines eternal life for us. Listen carefully to what he said. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now notice what Jesus did not say here. He did not say, now this is eternal life, to go to heaven when you die. No, he said this is eternal life, to know God now, today. Eternal life is to have a present tense, long-term love relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is not high in the sky in the great by and by. It is knowing God right now, today. Eternal life is to know Jesus. So eternal life is not something that begins someday when we die. Eternal life starts now and only continues in heaven. So again, heaven is essentially a new location for an old relationship. Do you see how this completely reframes the question, can you lose your salvation? Because again, what does it mean to be saved? A saved person is one who loves and follows Jesus. A saved person is one who loves and follows Jesus. So question, is it possible to stop loving and following Jesus? Yes, of course it is. And that's why Jesus and the New Testament writers gave us so many warnings urging us to remain faithful to Jesus to the very end. Because if you stop following Jesus, by definition, you are no longer a Christian. If you're not following Jesus, you are not a Christian. Let me say it again. If you are not following Jesus, you are not saved. I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you believe about God or Jesus or the Bible. And I don't care what you did in your past. I don't care if you prayed a prayer, if you got baptized, if you got confirmed. I don't care if you spent 20 years on the foreign mission field witnessing to cannibals. If you are not currently following Jesus Christ, you are not saved. And if Jesus comes back while you are in that place of rebellion, or if you die in that place of unbelief, your eternal soul is in grave danger. The New Testament is very clear. Our salvation in the end depends on our faithfulness to the end. I've provided you an insert in your bulletin, and it lists about 30 different passages in the New Testament that talk about this. And I paraphrased them for you. So these are for you to look up. It's everywhere you turn in the New Testament. Jesus talked about it. John did. Paul did. Peter did. Virtually every New Testament writer said essentially the same thing. We must remain in Christ. And you read it, and they speak with such urgency in their language. We must remain in Christ because our salvation in the end depends on our faithfulness to the end. 